Here's how you, you do the negative ion generation. You have a heated block and you vaporize cesium and cesium has such a low work function that you can make CS plus just by heating it. It ionizes thermally. And now you have a voltage gradient. Here's minus 32 kilovolts right here. Your sample's at minus 40 kilovolts. So this voltage gradient accelerates positive ions in that direction. And you're using CS plus ions as bullets that strike the surface of a bit of carbon which is your sample. You convert, the first step in a carbon-14 analysis, generally, is to convert the carbon to graphite. There are lots of ways to do that. It's, it turns out to be not a big problem. So you make the graphite. Now this bullet comes in, and it creates a plasma at the surface of the graphite. It it's an atomic particle coming in, with about 10 kilovolts of translational kinetic energy, it produces a plasma right at the surface. And from that plasma, the same voltage gradient that accelerated a positive ion that way accelerates negative ions that way. So you extract the negative ions and accelerate them down the beam path of your isotope ratio mass spectrometer. So now you've accelerated. Nitrogen you don't have to worry about, but you're accelerating the ions you really want, 14C minus, plus these other guys. And the spectrum, the raw spectrum coming out of that ion source looks like this. This is an actual scan, a very crude one, but a good one, of, of the ion beam coming out of one of those sources. Here's the 12 C minus beam. Here's the mass 13 beam. And here's the mass 14 beam, mass 15 beam. And here are the ions that are present in, in those peaks. And this is a logarithmic scale set up so that the top of the carbon 12 beam is one. And it's a pretty good instrument. The, here's the 10 to the minus six level. And so these beams are pretty well, well, the scattering of the carbon-12 is huge, of course, but, but you, you got, that's the raw spectrum that you see. The difficulty is that carbon-14 is down here on this logarithmic scale. If it were a modern sample, it'd be a 10 to the minus 12. If it were 19,000 years old, it'd be a 10 to the minus 13 still older, it goes, goes down still further. So you've got all of this trash on top of the signal you want to see. You get rid of it in, by having a really fancy mass spectrometer. This is an ultra-modern one. Here's the ion source that produces the carbon-14, or the negative ions, put it that way. This is just a, a steering system, a so-called low energy electric sector analyzer that steers the beam into a low energy magnet that separates the beam. It's about a 40 kilovolt ion beam coming along here and being steered into this so-called accelerator. This, this magnet is used to select which beam goes into the so-called accelerator, which I'll explain in just a minute. So you can set this magnet to transmit mass 14 to the accelerator or to transmit mass 12 or 13 to the accelerator. And it's, it comes in here at this end as a negative ion beam with about 40 kilovolts of translational kinetic energy. In the middle of the accelerator is a terminal that's at about, well, in this particular case, plus two and a half million volts. So an ion comes in here, it gets strongly accelerated, so now it has a translational kinetic energy of about two and a half million electron volts 
when it gets there, and you say, surprise, here's some argon. There's a, there's a, you maintain in the middle of the accelerator a fog of argon gas, about 10 to the minus 4 tor. So here comes this negative CH minus molecular ion floating along, and all of a sudden it's got to find its way through this argon. It doesn't actually hit an argon, but even if it just passes one, the CH ion gets all accelerated, excited I should say, you see how excited I am, but by, by the close approach to the argon. And the CH minus ion flies apart. It gets broken up, and now you've got a C minus, or maybe a C particle of some kind, and an H particle. Who knows how, where the electron stays? But you break it up. And so in the accelerator, the first thing you do is you break up the molecular ions, which are the problems, the, C, the, the 12 CH2 and the 13 CH. Those are your major trespassers at mass 14. And also, since you made this graphite probably in a Pyrex container, there will be lithium. You'll have Li2 plus as, as a, to L, Li2 as a, as a molecular ion in there from the lithium that was in the borosilicate glass that you made the graphite with. That's still a, a factor. Here's a, another picture of this. Coming in, you've got atomic ions, the ones you want, like carbon-14 minus, and you've got molecular ions, like 13CH, etc. They come in here where there's this argon stripper gas. They get broken up. And furthermore, the carbon gets more strongly ionized. The same thing that knocks off, that breaks up the molecules, knocks off still more electrons, and you actually wind up producing triply positive. Here it's, it's just the author, Volkenhuber, listed it as phi plus, but, but at two and a half megavolts, you wind up with C, 14 C3 plus as the major product ion. So now you've got triply positive 14C3+, plus, and it's accelerated toward a ground potential on this end of the accelerator. So it picks up three electron charges times two and a half megavolts, picks up seven and a half megavolts of additional translational kinetic energy. So leaving, you've got a 10 megavolt beam. So now that 10 megavolt beam goes into the high energy magnet and you can separate and look at uh, just using a plain old Faraday cup, carbon 12 and carbon 13, and you can transmit carbon 14 through another electric sector to get the beam totally cleaned up and you can sit down here and count carbon 14 accurately. And the sources that are used are so efficient that they produce for every atom of carbon that you put into them uh, about 0.04 uh, ionized products. This is a huge efficiency. They're about 4% efficient. The efficiency of a gas ion source in a typical mass spectrometer upstairs, if it's really good, is 10 to the minus 3. The efficiency of these sources is 0.04. So they produce ion beams that are measured in microamps, huge beams coming out. And so that means you're sitting here counting hundreds of carbon 14s per second. It's like shooting fish in a barrel to measure the carbon 14 abundance when you have an instrument like this. The, the way you maintain that fog of gas that surprises the ions at the terminal is you have a, uh, a source. Oh, you can't see it in here. There's, there's a, an argon gas bottle 
that slowly leaks argon into this system. This is a, a, a pressure gauge that measures the abundance of the, the pressure, background pressure of argon. And so it's, there are two turbomolecular pumps. This is the collision chamber. So you've got argon gas coming in here. The flight tube is in there. Argon gas comes in and diffuses that way or that way. To keep it from going into the rest of the spectrometer, there's a turbo pump here and a turbo pump here that pick up the argon gas and recirculate it so that you put in like a lecture bottle of argon and it lasts for almost a year because you recirculate the argon so efficiently. Not a big problem. But the interesting thing is that this whole assembly has to float two and a half million volts above ground potential, which means you need to power these turbo pumps at two and a half, that are floating two and a half million volts above ground. So you just can't plug them into the wall. It, it doesn't work. You have to have a generator that also floats two and a half million volts above ground. And you turn the generator by having a Teflon shaft that runs from here out to there, and you got a motor that you do plug into the wall. The mo motor turns the, turns the Teflon shaft, the Teflon shaft runs the generator, and you operate, you produce 110 volts, two and a half million volts above ground. Okay, so that's the measurement story. The last thing I wanna say about carbon-14 in the, tech, in the way of technical background, is this point about the bomb spike. Atmospheric nuclear testing peaked at the end of 1963 and the beginning of 1964. It actually produced a carbon-14 signal in the atmosphere more than twice the modern the defined modern level. And so atmospheric CO2 took this big spike upwards and has then been decaying downwards. These are actual measurements. They're, I chose the wrong color when I made the graph. You can barely see it. But, but this is now measured and monitored. So it looks like it's been falling off with a half-life of about 13 years. Well, you know, carbon-14 doesn't decay in 13 years. What's happening? It's going into the ocean. And as it goes into the ocean, here are, these are measurements. Ellen Druffel uh, at uh, University of California, Irvine, is the sort of heroine of, of uh, marine carbon-14 sea records in corals in particular. And she has produced all of these coral records that tell us how carbon-14 built up in the ocean to these levels that are, you know, like plus 100 to 150 per mil on the big delta-14 sea scale, and are now still, the ocean is sitting around 50 to 75 on the delta-14 sea scale above modern because of the bomb carbon-14 that's been inhaled by the ocean. The atmosphere has come down, the ocean has come up. This means, if you think about it, that if you are working in a river drainage basin or something like that, and you've got carbon that you think might be only 20 or 30 years old, you can prove that or test that idea by looking for bomb carbon in that sample. And there are multiple investigations going on around the world where people are doing these short time scale, decadal investigations by exploiting this otherwise tragic signal uh, uh, imposed on the atmosphere by nuclear testing using the so-called bomb spike.